Hi, and welcome to another edition of The Promising Creative, where I'm here with Simon Wheatley. Got it right there. Really lucky to have him here today, um, talking all things photographer life. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming here and being with us. Um, I wanted to start off, I think today, I'm going to jump in and out of loads of bits, so just excuse me if, we, if it's quite frenetic and we're going in and out of um, things. Um, but I want to go right back to the very beginning not the very beginning, but I want to talk about the... Can I get up and leave if it gets too confusing? Yes. Okay. Thanks. You're more than welcome to do that if you think it's getting a bit too wild. Uh, I want to talk to you about the 80s um, and your experiences in the... You're looking at your questions and your answers. So I just wanted to touch with you a little bit about your 80s, growing up in the UK, how you found things. I mean, I know, when I, I know how I saw the 80s. It was quite wild and how we were treated uh, as individuals. And I guess for me, when I lived through that experience, it, it toughened me up and it kind of drove me to be the person that I am today, a little bit more thicker skinned um, and more tolerant, I think, c compared to what I had experienced in those, in those periods in the 80s and the early 90s. How was that for you? And it, just to explain a little bit more about it your journey. It didn't toughen me up. No. It did the complete opposite. It weakened me considerably. And that was because I didn't have a community around me like you would have done. Yeah. Being mixed race in, in a, in a green screen in the 80s. It, it weakened me. You, you, yeah, you, you asked something, when you sent me some questions, you asked something about how that related to people that I'd come to know in my journey as a photographer. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, I didn't grow up on a council estate. I had a very middle class upbringing, but racism was the defining experience in my teenage years. And that is what transformed me from this confident, super confident boy who'd been living in the tropics with a, a, a big family throughout Malaysia and in, in Singapore too. And, but my father being English, being in international school and growing up in that world, but in the holidays with, with the locals, you could say. Oh, so I had, had the best of both worlds and I was so confident. It transformed me from the racism I went through, transformed me from, from that guy into the insecure and uncertain person that I became. Did you, how did you, did that, how long did it take you to get past that? I mean, did it, I mean, obviously it scarred you from. Yeah, you never get, age. you never really get over it. It's, it's, it's always there, but, but obviously now uh, it's like, yeah, people, people who know me now, they, they've got no idea of what I used to be like. I'm you know, confident in any situation I face. Um, yeah, it, it, I think it took, it took at least 10 years, I think really to, to process it out of me by uh, maybe my early 30s. Um, by the time it was kind of processed. Yeah, but one thing, one note I did make when I read that question was how uh, one is grateful for one's experience in life. And I have to be because that's what made me a photographer. Was right. that alienation that you referred to? Okay. That, that, that sense of, of, of becoming an outsider like I did and come to the end of school and then university, really end of university and, and like finding my, my first camera and going into a dark room and just being able to be alone in that dark room and to start to find myself as a human being through photography and being actually quite good at it it gave me some confidence because beyond having some ability in, in football, then I didn't really have anything to hold on to, to give me confidence. And suddenly I was, yeah, I wasn't making any money from it, but I was actually quite good. How did you, f did you fall into photography or was it, how did that? Moment yeah, happen? definitely. It was just, did being you? on my own, being in, in Brazil while I was university, like my third year of, of my degree, I was in Brazil and just 
again, being away from peer pressure and people and just wandering around with, I had a simple point and shoot camera, my mum's camera. And then my dad had an Olympus OM1 SLR. And when, when he saw the pictures that I was making my mum's camera and this like maybe sense of observation that he, he recognized, so, mm, he wasn't using it anymore. He says, you take this and, and, and you know, do your thing, have a go. So yeah, it did really, it did really come about because I had nowhere else to go and I knew what I didn't want to do, which was, because I didn't really fit into the public school life. I wasn't from that demographic. Like I only started off in that world because the company my father worked for paid my school fees. And I used to have a holiday job, and which is maybe I was the first person from Childhouse to ever have a holiday job. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least it's not, not in like someone's father's firm or something, but you know, anything I could get on service in high street to, 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 to survive. Yeah. Money. Yeah. To just have some pocket money. Yeah. Really. And, um, so, so yeah, I, I, I don't know how I got to that bit about not fitting in. Well, you just, um, so you, so you was in Brazil shooting some stuff, your dad uh, saw it and then he said, take the camera and you were like, okay. Yeah. And how did it progress from there? And I was a storyteller. So I, 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 I wanted to write cause I was good at, at, like history essays and, okay. and and like my dissertation, I wrote a long dissertation. I got a first for that on the US foreign policy towards Brazil, and and so he he saw these things and and like you know believed in me as a journalist. Um, I guess, uh, but I was so wracked by inconfidence or unconfidence that insecurity that I couldn't write. I had no belief in, in myself to write anything, but the camera was something I could just pick up and take a picture of something and then not have to dwell on it. And yeah. like, no, I didn't have to wallow in my uncertainty and insecurity. It was shot and it was done. Yeah. And then to go in the dark room and process to film and enjoy that. And for me, I've always been very playful. So cameras was like a toy too. So yeah, that's how it become. And did, did you then start to feel more and more that you wanted to develop this as a, as a, as a, as a line of work and like, this is a career path that I want to go down? That started yeah, straight to away. Straight, when course, you picked it up straight, as soon as you did straight it? Straight away. I mean, I did have like, I'd work in an off license or other, I had other part time jobs. I worked as an English teacher in Budapest. So I went, I went, I went to Budapest and then I went to Prague and then I came back. <coughs> I never came back straight after my graduation. Okay. So I write about it in Silverlink. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So I was doing photography, but I was earning earnings money elsewhere. But straight away I was shooting stuff and showing it to newspapers and magazines and in Budapest at least. I come back to England and trying to hustle with NGOs or some small magazines, but I didn't really believe in myself enough to, to jump in at a high level, which in retrospect, I think you, you had to be lucky to find the links to, to, to know the art director who'd commission you. And you see, when I started photography, there was no shortcuts. There was none of this Instagram thing, or it wasn't even the internet when I started, which was really very, very beneficial. You could just go go in deep to the medium, into the medium and develop organically rather than now when you just have to be someone straight away, which is so tragic. Yeah. Your documentary of the UK crime scene in the early 2000s is widely recognised and celebrated. What drew you to the subculture and how did you experience in interactions with the artists? So obviously we had Skepta, Dizzy Rascal, Wiley Giggs. Just Et talk cetera. to me a bit more about. Yeah, I suppose when I came across Grime, my photography was already quite developed. And I'd been doing it for about 10 years. So the first five years of photography were, and I believe still are, despite those pressures I referred to, they're about learning to see and just like cultivating some kind of vision through yeah. a lot of practice and, and error and 
finding out what works for you and gradually discarding those influences that you've you inevitably pick up when you start photography oh i like that photographer no. you, you is it obvious in 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 your your first your early work um and then the next five years i had been putting that to practice really so yeah I, w I was already in a place of some maturity as a photographer when Graham came around I'd been living in in Amsterdam and I'd worked on I'd worked on these tough stories I think partly because I'd had such a difficult time getting into the industry that that I'd, I'd do these stories that people would tell me were impossible, like the Moroccan youth. When I used to tell picture editors in Holland, I wanted to photograph the Moroccan youth like after 9-11. Yeah, they'd almost laugh at me <laughs> because so many Dutch photographers had tried it. And there was, but there was such an antipathy between the Dutch and the Moroccans, um, especially you know, from the Moroccan side. Yeah, they were really angry and, and confused. Um, it was, it's, a, it's a long story and we could talk a whole day just about about that particular issue and I mean I went three months I got arts funding and for three months I didn't make a picture I just hang out in youth clubs and just get to know people and it you know, took a while um, so that the 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 way that the hard drug users in central Amsterdam who'd for a generation been like tolerated there were certain streets that everyone knew were where they would congregate and you could go there or you you could just walk through and no one would touch you. It's just, that's where they did their thing. Um, but, but they were being like, pushed out by this like political force as a resurgence of the right wing. Um, yeah. And just clamped down. So them, I'd photograph that life, which is obviously quite edgy. Then uh, down in this big Southeast Amsterdam housing estate called the Belma, where, I was just fascinated by like the colourful utopia of it all and it was just being torn down because it hadn't worked and it's set in almost rural setting. That's where those drug users would end up as well. And they were just pushed out of the city centre and up in the ghetto. And I did did my first music video and then down there I worked with a couple of hip hop crews and so I I'd been I'd been doing a lot and of course also the work I was doing in London in Lambeth Walk around around there. Um with my, my when I'd, I'd switched to 35 millimeter cameras and I was going after that, that, that wayward youth culture, which for me was, I suppose, the prelude to my grime experience. So you mentioned these guys, these, these big names from the, from the genre. Um, I didn't really have much of a connection with them. So I'd, I'd meet them on a, on a Rewind magazine shoot. And I'd do that all on the medium format, on the six by seven. And that's how I started to, to photograph grime initially was was with that medium format camera um and when i first met the guys who bomb squad while at once the youngers of roll deep who became the lost dreams work i remember the first day i went to meet them i also took my mamiya 7 with me and spent the day and the night with them went to a radio at some ridiculous hour but i soon realized that that was not the way to go um to photograph grime and for me the grime work that that really counts um my my venture into that world was shot on the 35 millimeter cameras it's not so much i'm pleased i have those portraits of 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 skepta and everyone else obviously but they are not what for me constitutes really my grime work it's 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 that when I'm in there with my 35 millimeter cameras and I'm with my Leicas and I'm, I'm, it's not just Bomb Squad and Wilet, it's not just Lost Dreams, it's also the work I was doing in E3 around the same time. Um, it's the pictures I was making up with people who'd been around and in SLK up in Northwest London as well. Um, that's, that's for me really my grind photography. The portraits are some kind of like decoration of it. Okay. And when you came out of creating all that work, did you realise it was going to get 
you know when you sometimes you do something you're like okay this is this feels like it's quite special no I'm, and i'm pleased i didn't because i think they had an innocence about me and that's why the older generation someone like like jama why he say he i feel that he likes me is because he's i've heard him say it's that yeah this guy was doing it from day before he anyone knew anything about us and stuff and other people significant people from the genre have, have, have said the same thing to me and sent me messages even about it um which is very touching and yeah okay i never photographed a nasty crew radio set when like everyone was in the crew um but that's all right it's all right because i much prefer the way i operated than to have known that i was going to get all this like historical stuff and and had that energy about me that i got to go and get this got to go and get that no i could just be and exist organically and you you can't do everything in life that's one thing you learn as you get older okay would you ever go back and revisit and reshoot some of that stuff i can't why would i do that i can't do it you wouldn't i wouldn't entertain the concept in my mind okay it's done it's boxed to move on to the next thing the next project you can't do anything else but that there's no point i mean i was talking to someone last night at the at the book signing i was doing about my my time in france in we're talking about french hip hop and how french hip hop in 2006 i had just finished working in the bonlieu in a small town for a year and i deliberately didn't go after music because i wanted to like feel this the I wanted to be different from my London work and just this it's it's more architectural it's very very stark that work um and then I was in in I went to I was in Paris Paris a lot around that time and I hooked up with a hip hop crew there and I never because it was November and I actually wanted to go to Asia I was spent some time I was a bit I was going through so much hype that it actually was becoming depressing i wasn't very happy inside me for various reasons either so do i regret that i never photographed french hip hop like i wanted to because that's what i'd listen to more than grime like when i was say retouching work on my computer or something and listening to music then i wasn't really listening to grime in 2006 i was listening to stuff from france because i found it more i think political more social you know the the things people talking about and i also the, the beat and i was more into that now i like grime now i find it very nostalgic listening to those you know rough squad beats and and um you know other stuff of course danny weed and everyone else but um yeah you know i love i love listening to that now but but at the time it was a french work and the french french music and do i regret it well of course i do but i've also learned that you cannot do everything in life so it is what it is you just yeah you just you, it is what it is you just have to live with your live live with it yeah um the photography strives to capture authenticity and genuine moments i think you've kind of been talking about this already um in their work how do you approach your subjects and build trust with them to create an impact moment that truly reflects what you're about how do you go about doing that i mean you said that you've you go and you went and sat in you know the cafes and you spent time just immersing yourself in it is every job taken like that or i honestly don't know the answer to that that's good i've tried to analyze it and and give answers and find out with them in mind is what, it what it is, is it... it's i think what i've learned in retrospect it's about sincerity of intention Okay. Like I was always interested in these people who were making what they call grime music. I was fundamentally interested in people on a social level. I was for me it was a documentary that I was making. Um and I would already been photographing the council estates of London for a good 5 years before I heard grime and okay. that energy which again I think you you asked why I I went up to to grime like I did and it was that energy is that raw energy that 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 youthful waywardness that it 
reflect it. That I've spoken about it before, so I don't want to repeat myself on that. Mm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm getting getting um no. all no, you're, mis- you're going uh, exactly uh, where I, I want you to go. Okay, <laughs> it's fine. They'll cut that down. I'm not, I'm, I might get out. So what do they say if I get confused? You said I could walk away. I'm yeah, starting to get confused. Don't be confused. But I'm also enjoying being. Yeah, here, it's, so we're just it's tapping right. into stuff. Like I'm now getting to understand a bit more about you because I'm now understanding that maybe I'm authenticity y- you're about about, your, about seems, being uh, authenticity it's it's yeah as I say it's I think it is about sincerity of intention yeah that's, so we, that's all you can have you go you you you're from what I understand your your photography you're taking pictures or you're doing stuff you're creating moments but not based around just the artist it's actually based around what's going on in that in that environment and that music is what's in that environment at that moment in time if it'd been another bit of music you'd be from You'd be, it, that music would be uh, would be photographer. It would be taking pictures. It wouldn't necessarily be just about oh, it's grime or it's this or it's that. It's like I'm in the estates, and this is what's coming out of the estates. Like for example, back in the early eighties, it was break dancing. We were doing break dancing. We were young kids. People were break dance music. Coming Remember from Covent there. Garden? Yeah, well, we we had it in Walthamstow where I in Walthamstow people would just throw out the lino in Tottenham. The lino would go out, the music would go on, and people would start break dancing. But it was what was happening inside that environment. And I think, from what I understand, that's where you where it all came came from. You're in the environment, and then it appeared. I think I first saw break dancing in Covent Garden okay. on a Saturday afternoon. I think there's some group doing it there. I don't know. And so, I think. I kind of get a good idea. Uh, I've got a better idea than I would have had um, from just looking at your work. Um, the, phot- the photographic industry has an, a unique set of challenges and expectations. This is a question. Mm. How have you navigated the balance between your personal artistic vision and the commercial aspects of your work, especially considering your distaste for the hollow world of professional photography? So, did I have I have I said that before? Is that where you got it from? Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, fair enough. Um, look, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, it's well, just, it's it, it is what it is. Yeah. Again, and look, I think anything that is like fundamentally mo- money driven is is bound to be hollow. But within that industry, you do have artists who are trying to do their thing and find a way to survive so that 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 hollow industry is also populated by people who are many of whom would be genuine people too like if if i do a a shoot that's not something of my own instigation that someone's commissioned me does that make me hollow i hope not I enjoy doing fashion shoots. I like working with the team of people. I always have fun. And I'm fortunate that that, that life's put me in this this like very kind of surreal position these days, it feels, given how much I've I've had to struggle. Um of of people are like pleased to meet me and stuff on the shoot and it's really nice. It's very touching. But I always have a good time. Um however it's just that I value documentary work more highly. I, I hope that the books that I make will survive as not just like cultural artifacts, but but historical documentaries Time of steps, of, of, of yes, exactly. And there's the, 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 that's where their value lies. So it's just that I value that more highly. Um, you know, however, we have to find a balance to to survive to live. economically, yeah. and and it's that's life. We we have to find a balance to things. Yeah, you kind of have to be commercial to be. You have to be commercial so that you can be creative, but you also have to be creative to be commercial. You know, it, I don't know. I mean, you could. You there's different ways of 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 money coming, and if. I know, a big corporation, as has recently happened, in my case, buy some prints, and that's great. You know? However, that money might disappear on like family pressures, and suddenly 
someone's called you to to do a shoot and they want you to do this specifically um and you you know you've got to go and do it because of the check that's it's waiting at the, the end of the job the, the, these days it's a bank transfer that's yeah. waiting sometimes you have to wait months for it sadly but <laughs> but it's uh, it's it's there so you you yeah, you have to find your way to, to nav navigate the situation. Do, do you, is, there a, is there a job that you wouldn't take on then? Reality, navigate reality. Is there a job that you wouldn't take on? Yeah, definitely. I, I wouldn't want to do something that, that tortures animals. I, yeah, I, I, would, mean, I, wouldn't do, I wouldn't do a bacon commercial. I wouldn't do, like, I wouldn't do a McDonald's advert yeah. unless it was really for plant-based stuff. I've got my... I've got my um, there's lines yeah i've got my principles definitely so the next question we have is reflecting on your 12-year documentary of the uk grime scene are there any moments of photography that hold particular significance to you well obviously i've seen a lot and i've met many people and it would be difficult to it is difficult to choose one particular moment from all that experience because there's been so many moments that have touched me even like phone calls i received from people the middle of the night and they're in they just want to talk and because often i've found myself certainly back in the day when everything was underground i would be the only person who was you could almost say from mainstream society that some of these young people actually knew right um, and those people, yeah, obviously there's many, many touching moments. Um, I think I've always been interested in people's vulnerability, especially when there's that like, tough exterior image. Yeah. That, that's what I've found most touching, I think, those experiences. And if I was to choose one, then I'd have to go to the moment which sometimes also it's the things that you don't photograph, but you just observe and you're there so just as a human being, um, which for me is why I'm a photographer in the first place. And I would go to the Saturday afternoon, I think in March 2005, about four months after I'd met Crazy Titch, and he was going off to a rave in Birmingham. Uh, I think I've spoken about this before, so sorry to repeat myself, but his daughter was wearing this cute pink tracksuit and he's outside his home and it just it was a moment that he shared with her and he gave her a bag of mcdonald's don't think it was plant-based sadly <laughs> um and not in those days they probably didn't have the option in 2005 and it was just to see him with his daughter that softness which was so far removed from that image of because he was he was the most road crime MC his energy he was the one that they really rated in the youth clubs you know, Titch he's the guy you know, for, he's coming he's when, you, when you ask people yeah he's the one who really reflected the street um, and and I think it's possibly because those other pictures I made of him because those two in particular um the one where the dogs jump in the camera and of course the cover of Don't Call Me Urban then because they became so iconic that maybe I'm inclined to go back to the other side of that like harsh aggressive energy although I'd say even the one of him with the dog on the stair on the stairwell I think that shows a certain vulnerability to him as well um, because those became so iconic that I go back to the moment which was never captured that when it was a completely the, different side of him that yeah that stays with me somehow it's, it's, it's kind of the all-time the all-time most touching moment and of course his story what happened to him you know and the tragedy of 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 everything you know the guy that got killed too of course as well as his life sentence Do you do you print any of his work or any of your work that you like? Do you do you do you have it up anywhere or is it just all reluctantly because I've got 
a load of, I've, I've got a load of prints from <laughs> kind of the original Don't Call Me Urban exhibition and and I've, I've just I had to do something with it. So like gradually I've, I've taken it down from home bit by bit. I still keep a couple of pieces up of like there's there's the girl, there's Rasta woman at the back of Don't Call Me Urban and she was like a sister to me. So I've kept hers up in the house. And there's a panoramic from the Elephant and Castle in the tunnels where you've got this these like shades of different light. I have to, I don't think I've ever posted on Instagram. So only people who've got Don't Come Urban know that picture. But I'll repost it sometime. Or I'll post it sometime. Um, I guess. I'm not very good at that sort of stuff, really. It's so. just, but you keep some of it up and then. Um, so, so, yeah, I do, there's some of it around, but most of it's all like covered in bubble wrap and stored away. And, there's stuff in various boxes. I don't really like to see my own work around, but in my studio, some of those prints are up there because yeah, they represent, I might as well do something with it. So yeah. I have got some pictures up. Yeah, yeah maybe I've got like three, well. three or four because I've kind of run out of space, <laughs> storage space. So I've got to <laughs> use the walls. It's starting to go up on the walls now. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So looking back on your journey as a photographer, what advice? I mean, I'm sure you've been asked this question a lot, but what advice would you give to aspiring photographers and how they would go about finding their own unique voice? Okay. Because it's a big question. It is a big question and it's one that, that recurs and I don't want to give my, like, bullet points, which I've just done for the Abbey Road Music Photography Awards for their yeah. five, like, mo five pieces of wisdom. I don't want to repeat those. So, for example... Um, or other stuff that I've said before. So why don't we go about it this way and you perhaps draw upon things you've heard from me that might be important for young people to listen to. Yeah, and I then mean, I can, I can, I can yeah, come back okay, on that. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. So obviously I think the, the first thing that we spoke about where we touched on, you know, the racism that you you encountered or that was inflicted on you and how that you know i don't want to use the word crush but you know it, it like you said it pushed your your confidence and it made you feel unconfident and rather but weak or it deep but it deepened my sensitivity yeah and that's what's important so like often with people who become my interns or assistants i'm always always keep my eye open for well, it's, a, it's, it's the vibe, really, someone's vibe that's important. But I'm interested in people who've, who've been through experiences when they were younger that can deepen that sensitivity. You know, the, the outsiders, people who <coughs> might have been bullied in school, people who maybe lost um, someone young in their lives and who've... Yeah, who've, who've got that, that layer of sensitivity that their only experience bequeaths. You, 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 you came back from it and you channeled it from, from the conversation we've had. I came back, yeah, I came back. And life goes on and struggles continue to exist and we keep having to come back from stuff as well. But yeah, I did come back fundamentally from that. Because that's a big thing to come back from. Yeah, I haven't really crushed. thought about it. Now you say it, you say it. It's the first time in my life that I've thought, yeah, I did come back from that. Thank you for saying so. I mean, so I guess a, a word of advice is that no matter how much you're pushed and pulled into areas that are, that are not nice or people being horrible, um, you always have to try and find a way to be yourself. I think that's ultimately the way. Yes, we, you have to be authentic. Yeah, that's you, the bottom line. Like you can't that's just, all I can say really is... And it's hard because of this whole social media thing and this pressure to to be someone so quickly. That's that's I suppose the most important advice I can give. But it's very hard to turn that advice into some kind of practical application. Like if I was starting out nowadays and say you had been doing 
your thing for 30 years and achieved a certain level of reputation where people are looking up to you and listening to what you had to say. And I was, and you, yeah, you were to tell me, oh, you don't have an Instagram account for five years. Just do photography. How are you going to manage that? Well, it's easy for me to say, oh, you've got to just remove yourself from that world. But, okay, the recent, the recent guy who's, who's um, in terms of me is really interesting person. He's a French chap who's been doing a PhD in physics. And, yeah, he's very, very intelligent. Um, and I just liked his vibe. And he'd, he'd come across Lost Dreams in a, book, in a bookstore and thought, wow, I want to do this. And he's good as well. He's very good. Um, and I said to him, how did, how did I come to talking about Albert? <laughs> I got lost in, in him, we, lost we, in, we, in my yeah, thoughts. Like we're, we're it's quite a recent experience. Yeah, he's I mean, just, he's just finished with me a month ago and he wants to come back for six months next year. Okay. And because he, he, he's, he's so good at his, his physics PhD that he can, go for, he can go for one or two days a week on a five-day shift. Right, and they're happy with what he's doing. He's doing enough, so work. he's got time to come and do the photography. We're, 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 to, we're talking about like I guess you coming back from stuff, or and how do people? Oh yeah, I tell him as well. I say, look, oh, you say okay, Instagram. I say you may want to have an Instagram account, but perhaps you've only got three pictures on there because they're the only three that are are good enough. And like to do the internship with me, it's. Don't expect me to say you've got good pictures. You start from zero and hopefully we're going to get there and we're going to develop a... I put it this way. Um, it's about doing enough photography. You have to do enough photography to like, develop your technique yeah, and your, your own way of, of, your of seeing. And these days, especially this nonsense of everybody thinking they've got to shoot film to be legit when they can't afford it in the first place. So... How can you develop if you can't actually take pictures because the film's too expensive? Then shoot digital and just don't look back at what you're doing and still try and feel things. Be there, be present. Don't look at your screen. You know everything that you're getting from photographing with a film camera. You can actually, if you discipline your mind, you can bring that into the digital arena by not going back and looking at what. By you're not, shooting. yeah, by just being present. Yeah, and you know, put your damn phone away too. Yeah. <laughs> Turn that off. Like one of the things I said in Abbey Road was about I said, just try and imagine the world in which I began photography, where there was no internet, no mobile phones. And so then when I'd go out with my camera somewhere, it was just me and my camera and the world around, which I could go so deeply into because there was no distractions. There was no text message coming in even. There wasn't a simple brick phone, nothing. Yeah. No one I could call. I had to go to phone box and spend my precious 20p. Yeah. You know? I'm not joking. You no, know, I know. About, I know. About, you know, you I, didn't want to spend that 20p. I remember that anyway. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. you were there. So, <laughs> so you know, there was no, like, no like, kind of unlimited minutes. Yeah, you know? yeah. Even the first mobiles, you, you didn't have that. So, um, yeah, it's about being present. So and, there is being present, which is important. Yeah, and to, don't don't get caught up in that need to kind of justify yourself with like as a kind of online being i think also uh, from your when you was in brazil like you picked up the camera and you was you had that time on your own where you developed or fell in love with photography i started to to use a photography to tell stories to like not to tell stories i was not like i was working on some documentary but to to record my observations, which were, I suppose, narrative driven. Yeah. And then later I got into telling stories. First thing I did was, was go to Lisbon to live with refugees from Angola. I've recently been connecting with Blanco, who's from the, the Harlan Spartans, the guy who was in Harlan Spartans, who's a very sensitive guy. Um, I think he's, yeah, he's, going to be one of the most important UK rappers like when we look back on this in years to come um, and he is is Angola and just my um, emerging relationship with him has 
encouraged me to go back and look at those contact sheets again from that was 1994 I did that uh, so that was my first I suppose attempt at actually making a documentary was to live because Ang Angola because Portugal was um, was was very racist probably still is but in 94 it has only been 20 years since their colonies have been liberated with like you know wars as well of course so there was yeah it was it was a pretty dark place to be a refugee from angola with the civil war there and that was the first thing i did Again, I'm. I, I've, I've, I don't think you know. I'm it. confusing you're myself. You're so not confusing. That's I why, I'm, 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 that's why like I'm, I'm staying here. I'm not running away because it's me who's generating the confusion. <laughs> it's right. Like, and I think also <clears throat> from from you falling in love by telling a story with your camera, you. I don't think we've touched on belief that you believe that you were good enough to be a photographer or I don't think you've ever you've not in this conversation okay. we haven't gone to that it's a big thing where, belief belief because it's something because we have wow, to believe in what so we do so fragile belief if I look back at if I look back at those times then if I'd have known how long it would take if you you pulled the 23 year old Simon out of the past and sat down and said to him, look, it's going to take you this many years to, to get anywhere. And that was say a decade, I'd say before I'd started to, when I went to Amsterdam and I was working with the magazines and doing stories and making some kind of living from it. But London was too hard. That's when I went up in Amsterdam and I'd fly back. I know, so I'd never fly. I don't like flying short distances. I'd take a bus back in those days. I didn't have any money. I'd get the overnight bus, but now I'd get a train. Um, so I'd get the train as well from Amsterdam sometimes, but more often the bus. I'd come back once a month or once every six weeks and work on the London stuff. But it took me 10 years just to start to be able to call myself a professional photographer, which I think is something also overrated. And now there's this tremendous pressure to like be a professional from day. Whereas when someone asks me if I'm a professional, my reply is always incidentally yes because fundamentally i'm an amateur because amateur amateur does something for love professional what does it actually denote it, it it's implies the pursuit of some kind of financial reward yeah it's amateur's purity so i like to consider myself an amateur and i think that's something also very important for people and i tell these people who come into my orbit i say Look, go and do your three days a week. I've got, there's a girl who has just come into, into my world who, interesting how we met, she's Iranian, but from, from, from West London. And she has part-time job in a bar. And I think that's great because it means that you can have three days a week doing that. And the rest of the time you can just devote yourself to photography. And if somebody wants to pay you for doing something then so be it but you're in a position because you've got the money coming in you're in a position to to almost be able to turn that down if you don't want to do it yeah and you don't like their vision and it doesn't correspond with what you want to do yeah you know, otherwise you just do your thing and photograph what you want to photograph and so your belief or your that moment where you're like do you know what i believe that i can make this work I yeah was was that easy to no, come to you? Or no. Did not, it ever? Has it all. ever come? Or um, it's a good question. It's something that it's, it's an it's an ongoing battle. Would you say it's a battle? Battle is battle. I don't really battle. I struggle. I think. Okay, it's an ongoing struggle. <laughs> it's an ongoing battle. What's the difference? Yeah, it's an ongoing battle. If you want to put it that way, it Just is. Like... It is. But now I'm in a position now where I can. I'm a lot more secure because. I can, I can go out and pay for lunch because I know that I'm re I'm relatively confident that something will happen that month that Something's coming in. someone's going to want me to do something or some brand are going to want to use some pictures for this or that and even if there's nothing this month then I might get a bumper suddenly some bumper thing arrives next month yeah. and I'll be okay. So 
that belief now it's not the issue that it that it once was but it's taken a long time to get here a lot of work a lot of effort a lot of work a lot of a lot of of struggle and false dawns to you go through those don't ever i've learned to to and i still i still apply this all the time i've learned that the meal is only ready when i've eaten it okay explain a bit more so if somebody talks to you calls you and says boom yeah love your work want you to do this it's like we're ready to go we're gonna do it next week or next month or it's gonna be this that can't wait to work with you it's just gas don't believe it don't think about it just you reply okay cool someone writes to me on instagram or someone do okay sounds good so okay you can send more you know or talk to the manager about it just let if, me it's, know if it's, it's a if it's a you know so basically it's when a bigger, it's, when bigger it's signed client. we're about to shoot it that's when it's when it's signed to eat. when it's signed then we can really talk about it but yeah. otherwise that i'm going to be looking for my meal elsewhere yeah okay cool i like that analogy right okay i think i think that's i want to leave it on that note okay, it's all about the, it's all about the meal isn't it yeah when's the next meal coming well i've never used deliveroo i must say <laughs> honestly I